So uh, I'm going to get away from the back there. I presume I can boom and everybody can hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah OK, welcome. Um, so uh, you know, I, I had to um, play on the um, title, The Best Should Teach, because uh, one of the things that I'm very um, involved in is the investigation of um, teaching and learning. So I think the best should study teaching as well as doing it. Um, and really, the title should be um, The Best Should Study Learning, I think. But uh, that didn't quite fit with the title of this. Uh, Series. So um, I want to begin by thanking um, lots of people. Actually, I'd like to begin by thanking um, the Stiles family and Laura. Um, Laura deserves a round of applause in my opinion. Um, she, she really makes this event you know, ha happen every year, and, and um, uh, um, recognizing teaching is a, one of the wonderful things about this institution. Um, I'm also going to um, oops, acknowledge all the folks with whom I work uh, on a daily basis. So in the physics department, I am a member of the physics education research group. Um, it's just another group. We've got a nuclear group and a condensed matter group and a physics education research group. And there's lots of people. And some of these names you will see are uh, parts of school of education and chemistry department. And lots of folks, graduate students, uh, teachers, somewhat cut off at the edges because there's just too many. Um, and um, also, of course, I get lots of um, support from various uh, foundations and financial support from the federal government, and also from CU. So I'll be mentioning something about the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative, which was originally funded through the CU um, administration and has been really influential in what I do in, in my department and many other departments. So um, it's a um, moderately brief talk by my standards, but uh, um, I'm going to give you an overview of where we're going. Um, I want to talk about discipline-based education research. So um, I'm going to be talking about PER, physics education research. But you all in the room should substitute your academic discipline for the P. So there's philosophy education research. That still works. And then chemistry education research, engineering education research, history education research. And uh, I want to talk about sort of a theoretical base. What, what do you have to um, understand about human learning in order to, um, to, to start this kind of investigation. But mostly, I, I think people in this room are interested in practice and uh, impact. So I'll talk about introductory physics courses, because we've got some lovely um, and interesting results. I'll say a little bit about K-12 teaching, because that's also something that I'm really excited about. And Colorado is doing many wonderful things. Um, and uh, upper division, which is kind of what I'm interested in these days. If you can transform pedagogy for freshmen, is, is there something different about sophomores or juniors or seniors? And the answer is yes. There's lots of things different, but there's also many things in common. And so uh, we're, we're starting to learn about what, what that means. So OK, you've all got clickers. Um, I would, let's, let's see if the system works. So um, um, pull your clicker out, which was given to you. Don't forget to um, give it back when you're leaving. We need those things. And, um, Press and hold the power button, instructions at the top, it should flash green, and then type in AA. So that sets your code to um, match the system. Oops, that's not going to work yet. Now it should. So give it a try. And um, then you can vote on this question. And I realize already that I'm glad I had E, because there's, there's guaranteed to be lots of people in other. So STEM, School of Ed, Humanities and Fine Arts, Professional Schools or other, or more than one, or none of the above, something complicated. So I've got 109 votes. That looks to me like, like we've probably got just about everybody. If you're having trouble with your clicker, ask your neighbor. Um, they should be able to help you. And uh, I'll just show you this distribution. Um, we're, you know, it's always good to ask, because uh, we're all over the map. Um, with, uh, oh, yeah, you can change it. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, STEM is the dominant uh, part of this group, and then we're all equally represented. OK, so um, you know th that's helpful for me right now, because um, I want to uh, um, not overemphasize the physics part of physics education research. Um, so, so what is discipline-based education research? So you know, I had to sort of think about what I believe that buzz phrase means. And the first part of it is it's a study by physicists. So you know. There's a school of education here, and everything that I have to tell you, they already knew 100 years ago. Um, but kind of, we had to rediscover it for ourselves. You know, it's a little bit like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Um, I, so it's also politically important within a physics department to communicate ideas about teaching and learning to other physicists. It's very helpful 
when it's physicists using the tools and practices of physics research to try to communicate with other physicists. And I'm sure it would be the same in a history department for a historian to use the tools and practices and scholarship of history to convince and communicate their colleagues of the things that they're learning about student learning. So we look at how do students learn. So that could be a cognitive, you know, what's happening in somebody's head? What, what's happening to your neurons when you're learning physics? But it doesn't have to mean that. It could also be how do students learn as in there's a social and cultural context. And in fact, maybe you don't even think about the learning as happening in your head. Maybe you're thinking about the learning as what are the students doing, what are they saying, and who are they saying it to? So that's part of it. And then how do you know that they're learning? So this is a big deal for, um, for physicists. I need measurements. I, I need some kind of evidence that I can point to and quantify and talk about. How do you know that somebody's learning? And then last but not least, probably what you would think comes first is how do we help them learn? And um, I put it last intentionally because I'm arguing basically that the, the practice of a scholarship of teaching and learning informs us so that we can do a better job about helping students learn. And I come from the physics department, so people need to identify themselves as theorists or experimentalists. And sometimes, you know, people are interested in applications and then whether they belong in physics or engineering is ambiguous. But, um, you know, you can tell that physics education research is a young discipline because in the physics department, um, most people are one or the other of those three categories. And in, in physics education research, we still get to do all three, which is kind of exciting for me. Um, okay, so uh, another use of the clickers, um, physics question. I know everybody was looking forward to this. Um, so this is, um, th this is a part of how do we know they're learning? So many, many years ago, a um, bunch of physicists began interviewing students after they'd taken a physics course, trying to assess what was difficult or challenging about the underlying conceptual principles. So what you're seeing here is a picture from above. So that's a person, there's their head, there's their arms, and they're swinging this stone around their head on a string. It's like a dog toy or something, right? So can you picture it? Swinging the rock around or the, stone, the ball around. At point P, the rope snaps. So what does the ball do? Now you're looking from above, so you can't see the effect of gravity, right? That's the third dimension. So we're just asking in this plane, what does the ball do? Path A, B, C, D, or E. So I'm going to turn on, oops, if I can, I'll turn on the clicker. And uh, that's not going, so I'll just do it by hand. Oops. Oh, there we go. You're welcome to turn to your neighbor. <laughs> Introduce yourself if you don't know them and talk about this for 30 seconds. And, but, you know, just follow your gut. What's your intuition tell you? Because I think that's really important in physics. well. Um, I, I, I've asked this question to many different audiences and, um, uh, whoops, yeah, so, um, so yeah, uh, there's a very popular consensus for B, um, which the physicists would agree with. Um, and, uh, um, you know, what I'm going to argue, for those of you who um, voted other things, um, it's fun after, you know, when we go up and have dessert, we can talk about it. I would argue that A, C, D, and E are all compelling for good reasons. Good, interesting physical reasons. People bring in with them ideas about how the world works. And um, although A, C, D, and E are not how the experiment will come out, we can do this experiment and look at it, and we do that in class. But um, nevertheless, there's good reasons why people vote those things. And um, so I want to ask you uh, another question. Uh, let's see if I can stop this. So here's the, um, for this, for this um, purpose, what's more interesting 
is um, somehow my uh, there we go. So at the University of Colorado, in an algebra-based course, so this would be uh, pre-medical students, uh, integrated physiology majors. They're scientists, not the engineers and physics majors, but it's a science audience. How hard is this question? So I'd like you to think about that one and talk about it with your neighbors and vote again. Um, and you can think about what you believe the answer is, and you can also think about what physicists who teach this course think the answer is. And um, I'll leave you at option E if you'd rather just say, how could I know this? <laughs> Okay, folks, so let me, let me get you to now, um, if you haven't voted yet, just vote your instinct on this one. I, I gotta tell you, it's also, this is spectacularly difficult for me to like not walk out into the audience and, <laughs> and, and listen to your voices and hear what you're saying. It's just not how I teach. So this stage, it's really weird. Um, uh, so, so we're all over the map here um, with a pretty clear consensus. I guess I should... Um, I should stop the voting so you can't. <laughs> um, a lot of people think it's moderate or difficult. So, you know, here, maybe more than in the previous one, I would answer all answers are potentially correct. You know, you had some questions you needed to ask me, like, am I asking this question at the beginning or the end of the semester? Um, it changes a lot. Um, at the beginning, so first of all, uh, anybody know what physics faculty think the answer to this question is? The A or A or B. Okay, I mean, this is, this is Newton's first law, an object in motion remains in motion, and to most physics faculty, they look at this question and go, for crying out loud, don't, <laughs> are we teaching this in middle school? Uh, and, and in fact, I think we are teaching this in middle school, maybe not this exact question, but this idea for sure is um, one of the introductory ideas of, of physics. And um, for my students, it's a moderately difficult question at the beginning of the semester. Um, actually, actually, no, it's a very difficult question. Um, for, for the beginning of the semester, the score on this one's about 40%. So, you know, if I give an exam and I get a 40 average, I would call that dismal failure. Um, uh, at the end of the semester, it's gone up to about 80%. So I would say that's some, somewhere in the B range. Um, um, so, so we see some improvements, um, and that's, that's nice. If you voted E, and that was um, some of you, um, if you were a physicist, I would say, read the literature. <laughs> because this is a result of 30 years of research. People have been interviewing students. We know not only what are the interesting, difficult questions that students struggle with, but what will different populations do at various stages of their education on questions like this. And you know, if you're in another discipline, if you're in communications or history, uh, there may not be the same uh, depth of literature as there in, is in physics, but there is a literature. I can almost guarantee it. There is discipline-based education research all over the map, and you can find conference proceedings, and you can find websites, and in some disciplines you can find books and papers. In physics, we have a, a, a journal, Physical Review, which has many different um, uh, uh, pieces. There's PhysRev A and B and C for nuclear physics and particle physics, and now there's a PhysRev for physics education, so I can go and look at papers on this stuff. Here is a histogram of a national survey from 1998, so this is 16-year-old data, American Journal of Physics, so lots of physicists saw this plot, and um, these are all traditionally lectured students, and what you're looking at is a measure of gain on questions like that one. So that test got the name the Force Concept Inventory, and it, every single question was based on interviews and research on students. And um, take a look at that histogram. Okay, so what's the conclusion here about university-level traditional lecturing? So, 
it's not very effective. It's pretty depressing. And a lot of physics faculty looked at these data and shook their heads and said, not my class. I don't believe it. Um, but, but since 1998, so this was a study of 6,000 students at 12 universities. And since then, that number has um, increased by orders of magnitude. And it's very re repeatable data. So physicists also will say, well, it's educational data. It's really noisy. It'd probably be different any time you measure it. But no, it's always the same. And um, you know, students are learning about a quarter of what they didn't already know when they walked in the door. And what's different at different institutions, like at Harvard, they walk in the door with a 60%. And at Colorado, they walk in the door with a 30 or 40%. Um, and, um, but, but the gains are very similar. Um, I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about that. So where is that coming? Why are we dismally failing? This is 18, 16 years ago. So, so you know, I'm going to make one of many possible claims is that it's intrinsic in our educational system. So here's a picture of a classroom. <laughs> it's a 2,000-year-old classroom, so you, you, know, you laugh and say, well, that's not really what classrooms look like. <laughs> that's my classroom here at CU. And, uh, you know, it's different. Um, the seats are a little bit more comfortable. And, uh, and we can teach at night and when it's raining now. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, look, the, this classroom was built with a philosophy of, of lear learning in mind. And I'm going to give you a technical diagram of the, the model of, of how people learn that is consistent with the efficiency of that lecture hall. Um, so many of you have probably seen this joke. It's getting a little tired. But, you know, there's a lot of aspects of this that are built into our, the, the assumptions of our system, and they're, they're manifestly nonsense. Students aren't empty, and they're not passive, and learning isn't putting a thing into your head. And, and I don't want them to all be the same, because they're not, and they're not going off to a factory. Right? Everything about this picture is wrong, and yet the environment in which we're being asked to teach is kind of built around this idea. So uh, there is some more data from Mr. Hake's uh, um, um, paper which is interactive engagement classes. Those are classes predicated on the philosophy that y the teacher cannot put physics understanding into the heads of students. Students must construct it. And there's a variety of pedagogies associated with the blue band. What's, what's a characteristic that strikes you about this graph? When you look at these data, anything strike out? It's, the blue is broader. Right? So, so there's a big variation in the kinds of interactive engagement classrooms. And um, what else? Anything else strike you as interesting about the data? Anything inspiring if you were a physics teacher? Some big games. You could do better. You could do better, and you're not going to do worse. Right? So go ahead and try it. <laughs> so this plot really did. It had a, a, a profound cultural impact on physicists all across the country. And in a certain sense, 1998 was really the beginning of physics education research. There were a smattering of amazing, dedicated people in the 80s and 90s who were doing this stuff, Lily McDermott and Joe Reddish and a bunch of folks. But after this, it, it began to become a, a subdiscipline of physics. Here's Colorado data. So you know, I said these are educational data, but they're pretty reproducible. We are landing exactly where Richard Haig predicted, because we are doing interactive engagement for the last 18 semesters. And then you could start to ask questions like, why does Colorado have such a big spread? Well, I've got some answers to that. Like, for instance, there were three semesters in the middle of those 18 when the one hour a week that we turn over to the graduate students, we told them, go back to the old way. Go to the board and explain the physics to the students. And those were three of the worst semesters that we've had. So all the other semesters are semesters where we incorporated um, Tutorials, which is a research-based pedagogy, comes out of the University of Washington, and learning assistance. So I got to take a moment to pitch. How many of you know about the LA program? Raise your hand, please. Let me invert that question. How many of you are not familiar with the learning assistant? Wow. So if you learn one thing in my talk, we've got an awesome program. Valerie Otero is here somewhere. She's the founder of this program, and the, it's really her brainchild. Um, I got involved early on, but not at the, at the starting stage. What we do is hire undergraduates. They just took a semester of physics. They are probably a freshman. And we recruit them to apply to become a learning assistant. And they may come back the second semester of their freshman year or their sophomore year. They've expressed some interest in learning more about the possibility of thinking about becoming a teacher. And because uh, they're, they're being plucked out of a class of you know, engineering and physics majors. And um, we're very selective. In physics, we hire about one in four applicants, because there's a really high demand to do this. And we pay them. 
And um, they, they help the TAs. They team up with the graduate TAs and they run these tutorial sections, which I can tell you about. If you're interested, I'll show you a picture. And um, you can see that it has a pretty profound impact on student learning. And we're doing better than any traditional lecture. Um, and we actually have a little bit of data from Colorado that I don't show because I didn't collect it, but it was a very popular and award-winning uh, traditional lecturer who landed smack in that big red bin. Um, so, so this is wonderful and kind of exciting, and we're trying to figure out how to move all faculty to the right. Um, one of the things that we've observed is that if a junior faculty member teaches the course for the first time, they're often on the left side of the blue band, and when they come back and teach it a second and third time, they shift to the right. So far, it's happened every time in 18 semesters, so that's interesting. So let's do another click a question. Um, see if I can get this thing going. Um, some little, ah, there we go. Um, so, okay, think about your own discipline. So suppose you could improve student performance on a measure like this. <laughs> this is a forced concept inventory. It's like 30 questions, it's multiple choice. To your colleagues, it looks like middle school. It's underpinnings. It's not the kind of calculational problem solving stuff that my colleagues would argue is the, is the essence of physics. It's the, it's the underpinning concepts. So what do you think? Should we do this? So A, of course, at any cost. How about B? Uh, sure, if the cost is low enough. So I put a little asterisk there, not because I have a footnote, but you, you decide what low enough means. Um, C, it should be up to the departments. This is a kind of a departmental level decision. Maybe it's different in philosophy than in physics. How about, this is, an inst this is a university with tenured faculty and, and instructors. Maybe it should be up to individual faculty. In your class, you decide. And E is you don't fit in any of these bins. And again, I'd like you to talk to your neighbor because you know, it's a really ambiguous question. There's definitely no right answer. But I think it's worth thinking about for a second. So have at it. Again, this might be a great conversation starter for uh, after, the, after the talk when we're eating dessert. Um, if you haven't yet clicked, let me you know, just get your, your gut impression. You're always welcome to vote E. I, I often have E in physics class when there is a correct answer, oftentimes. Um, nevertheless, I'll have an E, I'm not sure, or it's ambiguous, uh, and that can really be productive in a large classroom to, to start some conversations. Um, I'm going to stop this vote. And um, so if there's any administrators in the room, I, I really want them to see how many of this audience thinks the answer is A at any cost. Okay, I agree, give me money. No, so, so look, uh, we were having a discussion up front. What, what exactly does at any cost mean? Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. I think in the physics department, we have figured out ways to improve on such measures at relatively low cost. The LA program isn't free but it's not expensive by most standards that you would consider either. It's sort of course fee kind of expense. Um, so uh, I'm gonna answer that um, within my department, the answer is really E, because the physics department um, did not decide that we should be changing our pedagogy. Um, it, and, and in a certain sense, it's up to individual faculty, but, but really what happened in the physics department is we said it's none of the above, let's just talk about it. So we have conversations, we have brown bag lunches, 
faculty discuss education from time to time, and um, you know, we have arguments about, is it the FCI that we value, or is it this traditional problem solving, end of chapter kind of problem solving? What is it that we value? What should we be measuring? Most of my colleagues are in agreement that, sure, why not improve student underpinnings? It's not our only goal. It's sort of a, a, a low um, bar, and, and we should certainly do better at it. Um, if the university were to say yes at any cost, we'd start building these. Um, this is a classroom that comes from um, uh, MIT and um, North Carolina State. Uh, it's called a scale-up classroom. We have one classroom like this that I know of on campus. It was built by the um, biology department, and um, I can't get scheduled in there because it's not centrally scheduled and it's always full. And, um, and anyway, I, I have too many students now to fit in that one room. Um, but you know, this is a classroom that's designed with a different philosophy of teaching in mind. Students are it, it, in groups and there is no front to this classroom and so it would become awkward to stand and lecture and you would have to come up with appropriate useful activities for the students to engage in. Um, here's what we do in physics. We spent, I don't know, a thousand dollars and bought like eight tables and uh, got an undergraduate to build some little walls to block the sound and oh, check it out, you know, we bought a magnifying glass and a candle for the optics lab. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and there's the learning assistant, he's wearing a tie, good for him. Um, and, uh, and you know, look, look at what the, the LA is doing. It, you know, he's not standing and lecturing, it's the students in the group who are explaining the physics to the learning assistant, because he's a learning assistant, not a teaching assistant. And um, um, these are very effective, and you've seen some of the data. We've got lots, lots more data um, about that. So, um, you know, this is a different kind of classroom, and it, it costs more than money. I just went through the last two days working with our new batch of incoming graduate teaching assistants, helping them to understand the pedagogical philosophy and the practices associated with this room, because you're never at the front of the class lecturing. The whole class, LA and TA, circulate and ask Socratic questions. And uh, of course, it's helpful to have research-based materials. So OK, that's individual course level. And now you could ask, what about institutional change? So you could have faculty members like Steve, right? I, I, I'm all excited. I win teaching prizes. I bounce around. My students call me the human electron. And um, I, I pity the photographer who's trying to like, film me while I'm lecturing. But, um, that's probably not a model for departmental transformation. Because if I bounce around and do all sorts of cool stuff and then have to pitch it and sell it to my colleagues, few of them might buy in, most won't. Nobody likes to be sold stuff. So um, uh, we're following the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative model of course transformation. Um, we, we, we are centered around faculty and staff. And you could ask me, why aren't we centered around students? And that's an interesting question, but this is the model. Um, and we start up here. It's not you know, a big cycle. We start here. We have faculty meetings and we talk about what students should learn. We establish goals, consensus goals. And then we use those to inform our investigations of what are students learning. You could say, oh, we already do that. We give exams and homeworks. But you can do more. There's lots of people, School of Ed, Psychology Department, discipline-based education researchers who have learned methods. You interview students. You videotape students. Right? You give the kind of assessment like I just showed you to decide what they're learning. And now we get to what everybody in this room is probably interested in, right? Which instructional approaches improve student learning? What do you do in the classroom? And again, we're building first on the top before we start tackling that bottom. And then we can iterate on what are the students learning? Is it working? Try again, if not, and um, hopefully apply some research-based methodologies for all this stuff. So um, I'm gonna start to wrap this story up. Um, these data came from Kathy Perkins, who I think is in the audience. Um, thank you, Kathy. So she um, um, basically looked at upper division courses in the physics department. So what you're looking at is a time marching from left to right. So there's SF, SF, it's spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall from 2004 up to 2011. And going down is upper division advanced physics courses, mechanics, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics. This checkerboard is uh, the, the sort of senior level elective courses that only get offered once a year. So what I'm gonna do is put a little check mark in every box where a faculty member used clickers and peer instruction in an upper division physics course. So I want you to think about that for a second. If this was almost any university in the country, I'm done. <laughs> because 
Are you nuts? Clickers in the upper division, right? Who would do that? This is serious stuff, right? We're, 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 we've got blackboards filled with equations and, and there's no time for clickers. But um, you know, I'm in a physics department that um, thinks about this stuff. And um, so um, I'm going to put little stars in the semesters when it's a physics education researcher who led the show. That would be um, Michael Dobson, also in the audience. Thank you, Mike. Um, for inventing some clicker question ideas in statistical mechanics, followed by three more other, we cycle faculty through courses. Nobody owns a course in the physics department. This is a non-education research faculty member who just had done it uh, with freshmen and thought it was a cool idea. This, I think, is how things would have remained had it not been for the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative and the support that comes from the university to hire a postdoc to join the physics department and help us and, um, and to support faculty. And here's what happened after the physics department joined the SEI. Well, that's, that's really amazing. It's a phase transition. We all drank the Kool-Aid. And uh, <laughs> actually, no, we didn't all drink the Kool-Aid. Look, there's lots of empty spots because there was never a departmental decision made. It's only individual faculty making this decision based on, in some cases, evidence and publications. In other cases, not. It just felt right and people did it. So to me, this graph is very exciting. It also you know, doesn't mean that this will happen in your department. Okay, if you join the SEI, well, the SEI is wrapping up its five-year mission, um, but like Star Trek, there will surely be sequels. Um, and uh, um, in fact, right, there, are, there are other ways in which the institution uh, uh, is, is supporting this kind of transformation, and it's worth asking around and finding out how your department can, can get involved in that. Um, I'm going to end. I got this um, title from Michael Dubson, a colleague of mine. Um, it's a, a motto for doctors, but I think it works for all of us um, as teachers. Kill as few patients as possible. So, um, you know, I can't teach if I don't know my audience. And so this kind of talk is pretty tough. I had to ask Laura who's going to be here and make some intelligent guesses and w whether I, you know, hit the mark or not. Unclear. This is really different than when I'm teaching freshman physics. I didn't say much about this. But a lot of our education research is not about physics content. It's about student attitudes and beliefs. So if a student in a uh, history class believes that learning history means memorizing names and dates, probably it's a serious problem. The faculty member thinks that learning history is something very different. If a student thinks that learning physics is plugging numbers into equations, we've got a problem. They're going to fail all my tests because that's not what I'm testing them on. So I need to understand the nature of their beliefs, not just about physics, but about learning. And um, that really helps me to teach in a different way. Um, my clicker is dying on me. What's going on here? Um, lots of data that active learning works. And um, you know, some of the data that I showed you suggests that you might think that if you can calculate acceleration, you know what acceleration means. But the data suggests no. Those are two separate things. And conceptual understanding doesn't come along for free. And my focus is not on teaching. So I don't give talks to faculty on how to teach. I, I largely give talks about student learning. And I think that <coughs> shift in emphasis is really the essential ingredient in um, education research in all disciplines. So that's the end of my summary, but I'm not done because I got conclusions too. Um, <laughs> you, you, you might be, I mean, you might be surprised that this is my conclusion, given what I just said. But I believe this. Teaching is an art. And I think uh, probably everybody in this room agrees with me. But I'm going to also argue that teaching is a science. I don't see this as a dichotomy. Teaching is an art. It's a science. It's a scholarly activity. So now I don't think I'm excluding anybody in the room. And uh, you know, we're, we're at an institution. It's an R1 institution. I don't see teaching and research as separate missions. And you know, maybe they're connected by the, the, the one lecture at the end of the semester when you tell your students about your research. No, I, I think that <laughs> teaching is demonstrably can be improved by scholarly study. So the, the history professor will engage in history education research differently than I engage in physics education research because they're going to use the scholarly tools of their discipline. They don't produce plots with error bars like I do. That's how I communicate with my colleagues. Philosophers communicate in one way, historians another way. Great. Every department will figure out their way, their scholarly approach to research, apply that to student learning, and then communicate with their colleagues. And to me, that seems like the path to a um, systematic rather than random walk through education space improvement. 
So I'm going to stop here. Um, we do have a web page, PER, for physicseducationresearch.colorado.edu. And um, I'm happy to open this up for a few questions, if that's all right with you. Thanks. So, questions, comments? I can wait you up. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret. Can you comment a little bit about the flipped classroom approach? Have you tried it? Okay, so the question was, uh, can I comment about flipped classrooms? It's, um, it's a buzzword that refers to the idea of if I'm arguing that students should be working in small groups, there is still content which needs to be transferred. Some of that traditional classroom, I mean, I'm transferring some content right here and now. I, we didn't spend the whole lecture doing small group activities for a variety of reasons. But if you're teaching a physics class, you might imagine that I could remove that entirely out of my precious classroom time, have some videos for the students to watch. They are now prepared with the factual information, and then we really could spend all of our time arguing, discussing, debating. And, um, there is a certain extent to which we do that already. I, I um, think of my class as a little bit backflipped, um, which is that I, I find it hard in a class with 600 students to convince more than 100 or 200 of them to do anything in advance of class. Um, and, but on the other hand, after being introduced to things in class, it's more likely that they will be uh, motivated to want to go and learn what they need to learn to succeed on the homeworks and the exams and the other activities. And so the backflip is to move the out of class factual transfer to afterwards when you need some factual information to solve a problem, go find it. So yeah, lots of people are exploring that. There are plenty of um, physics research papers about a variety of different classroom environments. And I don't know much about the literature in other areas um, of, about how effective that is. But, but this, you know, the School of Ed would argue that this is sort of a, an underpinning ph philosophy for preparing future K through 12 teachers, is that we don't spend all of our class time just talking. Question in the back. So you stated one of your last statements was teaching could be improved by a scholarly study. What about reversing that? Do you think scholarly study can be improved by teaching? And it probably depends on the discipline, but it almost seems like you're making an excuse for, for why you should teach. And, and, and I don't know, I, I was wondering if you, could, if you think you could maybe reverse those. Ha. Huh. Well, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So could scholarly research be improved by teaching? Are you asking whether um, scholars at a university do a better job in their research life if they are also teachers. I think that's pretty Im Im implicitly assumed in the structure of our institution. Um, we, we, we believe that it's not two separate jobs or we would probably have only teaching jobs and only research jobs so that everybody could become masters of their own domain. So I think that the institution and I believe that doing both is, is mutually supportive. But but it is not, just as conceptual learning doesn't come along for the ride, I would argue that mastering your scholarly discipline doesn't automatically make you a great teacher of that discipline. That, that I think we have very compelling evidence for. And so treating your teaching with the same intellectual discipline that you treat your scholarship, that you need evidence, that you test hypotheses if you're a scientist, right? You try to do controlled studies. Um, that, I believe, is the way that I'm thinking of using your scholarly um, tools and applying them to teaching. Is that answering your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mary. I think that was an E. <laughs> that was an E. Yeah. So, Steve, you know, one of the interesting things you point out in that plot, the chart that shows what advanced courses in physics are you using clickers? Yes. So you show some buy-in, but not total buy-in. That's right. So do you believe a department should incentivize <laughs> the use of these techniques? And if so, what incentives might work? It's a great question. So the question, if everybody couldn't hear it, was should we be pushing faculty to do this now that we have evidence that it works? <laughs> um, 
incentivize, right. So, so sure, why not? I mean, I, I think all, all, all faculty at this institution want to improve their teaching. And we, we all, this is our mission. We want students to learn more. And um, so, yeah, I think we're also incredibly busy. And so asking faculty to learn essentially an entirely new scholarly discipline on top of understanding theoretical nuclear physics, now you also have to understand the teaching of theoretical nuclear physics. It's asking a lot of faculty. So yeah, um, what incentives would I offer? Um, um, you have to reward people for focusing some, some of their time. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think right, for most faculty, we're, we're willing to spend lots of time on things that we're passionate about. But if you don't give me any reward, so I'll tell you a little story. When I got that BFA award in 1998, it was, uh, Dean Stevenson noted that it was fairly early in my career. I came here in 93, got a teaching award in 98. You do the math, I wasn't tenured yet. And a colleague said, that was a big mistake, Steve. What were you thinking, right? How are you gonna get tenure now? Because you've just demonstrated that you, that you care too much about teaching. <laughs> so that was one colleague, it was one colleague, and he's, retired now so um, but but you know that had that really stuck with me for a long time and and yeah you would like to build a system where nobody says that or even thinks it and and more strongly it means that um, at all level you know it has to come it can't come top down only uh, and how does it come bottom up I, you know I've got several Carnegie Awards Carnegie's philosophy is they started trying top down having the, the university president state that teaching is a, is a key mission and that all faculty need to spend more time on it and that really didn't influence very many departments. The bottom up was to award people like me, you know, a summer vacation in Palo Alto to go learn about, about um, scholarly teaching and come back and then just be a faculty member who sits on committees, on tenure and promotion committees within my department and says, wait, we, sh we should be valuing teaching as well. But, um, I don't have any quick and easy answers for you. But we should be thinking about it, and we should be incentivizing. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Steve. Please. That's good. I, I know that you are very serious about what you presented to us. Okay, I am. However, you don't appear to be very serious, and you're having too much fun <laughs> uh, doing this. Now, again, I bring that up because this is and you mentioned an A1 research institution, where I think that there are a lot of faculty members who think that you can't teach, you can't show people that you're having fun doing this. Why, why that delivery that, that you presented to us today? You know, all of my colleagues in the physics department, when I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they value teaching, they care about their teaching, they put a lot of time into their teaching. And you know, I also showed you data that within the physics department, which by many standards, physics departments are very conservative. And, and you know, we, we evaluate faculty based on publications and citations, right? That's pretty much how tenure and promotion l largely goes in physics departments. And yet, y you saw that plot of, of how much buy-in there is with relatively little amount of institutional support. So that was a postdoc for a while, two postdocs, you know, it's great having postdocs. They work with you and they do, they do a lot of the materials development. They help collect data so that you can focus on what, what you focus on. So um, if you're worried that like I'm having too much fun and therefore people won't listen to me, um, you know, part of my message was I'm not trying to be a salesman. So I don't go into my department and try to pitch this to people because I'm pretty sure that wouldn't work. Um, instead, I collect data, we have faculty meetings, I present the data. I would love to imagine that you know, physicists are so rational that if you, <laughs> if you provide them with enough data, you know, they will, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so your point is well taken. I can't help myself, I love this stuff. And you know, I, I was a theoretical nuclear physicist. Uh, I got tenured on that basis and then I did the big switch and I imagine there were probably some colleagues who kind of cocked their head and wondered what was going on. Um, seems to have worked out okay. <laughs> uh, so Laura, maybe I should let you pick people and you can decide when we wrap this up too. Um, somebody tell me what time it is. It's 7.27. Okay, let's wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wish for you, Steve, for 
your students, for our graduate students, and for all physicists that you keep having fun. <laughs> Thank you.